So my name's Ollie Clark, uh, work at Modern Dream, set up the company at the end of 2013. And um, yeah, I was lucky enough to be a BAFTA Breakthrough Brit, and that enabled me to set up Modern Dream and get some, you know, get some momentum behind the company and get some investment in to do our game, which is LA Cops, which is, if you're not familiar with it, it's a top-down shooter. We wanted to go for a bright, vibrant art style, and uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about how we, how we generated that, and hopefully you can get some, uh, some insights yourself. Um, hopefully I have a video. Is it going to play? Uh, the circle's spinning. There we go. Okay, so that's the game. Uh, be out next month. Literally going in submission now. The team's working incredibly <laughs> late nights. Um, so, yeah, the first thing, when we came out of Blitz, uh, the studio I used to work for, we realized we didn't need um, uh, a studio with uh, admin IT. What we actually needed was uh, tables, chairs, broadband, and a place where we could share with other teams. Uh, a little like the Dutch Game Garden, I guess, but uh, we're not as advanced as those guys. Uh, so we set it up as a, a co-working space, I guess inspired by them. We've been working out of there. We have regular events. Uh, this was our opening event last May. Uh, we have a good range, about 170 uh, members of the group, and they're around where we're from, Leamington Spa in the UK. There's actually around about 1,000 developers plus. Uh, and it came out of Codemasters. So several studios came out of there, and now several indie studios. So it's quite a vibrant scene. Um, this is us, I think, when we were just starting to work. And this is generally how the layout works. Uh, and our aim is to really get great products to market. It's, it's not there for its own sake. We're trying to make games that can go to market, um, generate a good return on the investments that go in, and keep it sustainable. We want to keep making games. We want to, want to do it sustainably. And it's about competitive cooperation. We are competitors, but we're finding that by working together, we're actually all getting a lot further ahead. Uh, we're sharing information, which is helping all of us. And it's being adaptable. The market, uh, what I'm seeing, is it's changing every six months. We have to keep being aware of what, that there's a new phone out, um, there are changes in uh, how free-to-play works, how premium games work, and we have to be uh, incredibly adaptable, and that's what the Arch Crisis is set up to help us do. Um, so this talk is using the art of past masters. Now, how do you get a game to actually stand out visually and grab people's attention? And this isn't um, a new issue. This is something that goes back to, to the Renaissance. Those artists weren't just thinking, I'm just going to do this for the sake of doing it. So they were trying to stand out themselves. They were competing with each other and trying to do the best art. Um, and it's looking at some of those uh, guys and how they did it. Um, what started me on this journey, is anyone familiar with Gobelins? The uh, you know, I, I was uh, an animator uh, back in 2006, and I was uh, looking at their work and just saying, wow, this stuff's amazing. How do these guys do this? And then someone turned to me and said, uh, yeah, they're all students. I went, what? I thought I was good. And I looked at their stuff. I thought, oh, my God, I'm, I'm rubbish. What, what, what can I do? How can I get better? And um, someone who um, knew how they work, he said, he said uh, first, they teach them to be artists. Then they show them how to use the tools. I'd done it the wrong way around. I learned how to use Maya, how to use a uh, game engine, how to export assets. What I should have done is learned how to become a good artist. So it started me on this journey. And um, I like this picture. It says, uh, the, uh, the true artist reveals mystic truths. And for me, that's what art is. It, it reveals things that we hadn't seen before. It gives us new perspectives. And through looking at those uh, new ideas and perspectives, you can introduce them to other people. And those light bulb moments that you get from art, you can use them in games to, to just ping a light on someone's head and grab their attention and make yourself memorable. So I started on this journey just looking at um, um, different artists. So first we're going to look at um, what art means, what it is to be an artist, and then we'll look at getting the tools to do what you want them to do, um, which is kind of the journey we went on for LA Cops. 
Um, both my parents are from, from the arts background, and they, they taught me through going to like Monet exhibitions in London and various things that creative people are broad people. Uh, your creativity comes from the breadth of experiences that you have. So I try and experience as much as I can. I, I don't say no to anything, and I should say no to things, but just because I just have too much to do. But I try and do as much as I can, try as many different things as I can, ranging from, I've just gone into coffee this year, I never used to drink coffee, but now I'm learning there's this whole world of coffee out there. I tried on a bow tie, it doesn't suit me, it looked terrible, but at least I know that, I've tried those things. Um, so. It's about being as broad as possible. And to be broad, we need to be curious. We need to ask a lot of questions. So I'm just going to uh, run, run by some questions here. Does anyone know how many colors we can see? Anyone ever, ever think about that? It's actually, on average, it's, very, it's partially subjective. It's, it's around 10 million that, that the average person can see, 10 million colors, which is interesting when you think about our technology in games. We can display you know, well over 16 million. And interestingly, I read an article recently that, that there are some people who have a genetic mutation. They can see up to 100 million colors. Now, I don't know if that's true or not, but it gives you, gets you thinking like, OK, there's so many colors out there. What is the number of colors we can see? It's not set because everyone has a different perspective of color. Everyone sees slightly differently. You start thinking about the world along those lines. There's another question. Uh, how many frames per second we can see? This gets a lot of interesting answers. Has anyone got an idea? Uh, a lot of people say 24, which isn't true. It's, uh, and it's a trick question as well. It's, 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 uh, it's, it's uh, flicker, fusion, sorry, look good. flicker fusion frequency is around 72 frames per second. So the average distance you are from a screen, you can see up to 72 frames a second. And you think about films, they're played back at um, 24. Uh, you're missing a lot of information there. And interestingly, in games, when a game drops from 60 to 30 or less, we really notice it, we really feel it, which is an interesting phenomenon. Uh, but when you think about um, 3D films that you go to the cinema and they make you feel sick, part of that reason is because the frame rate isn't high enough, and that's why The Hobbit, they put it up to 48 frames a second, and then when people go and see it at 48 frames a second, they go, actually, that's a studio. It, it gives you much more clarity of perspective of what you're seeing. Um, that's the next question. What resolution is our eyesight? Uh, what resolution do we see? So you have a monitor in front of you. Generally, that, one, that monitor there is 1080p. That's 1080 up, 1920 across. Uh, that's the kind of resolution we have there. Our eyesight is 576 megapixels, which is 30 times more than HDTV. And just for fun, I, I made up a, a Photoshop image in that side. And it came out at uh, 33,000 by 18,000. Uh, that, that kind of resolution. If we start to get some perspective on that, uh, so you can see video CD down in the bottom right, then you go to DVD, which is a big, big leap up, and then you go to 720p and 1080p, which is kind of where the average display is right now. And you look at 2K, a little bit better than that, and 4K is starting to come online now. You see that in the corner there. And it's worth being aware of all those different resolutions, how, how they affect how you play the game. Um, let me show you the next slide, which is our eyesight. You compare the 4K to our eyesight. That's, that's the kind of canvas that we're working with there. And within a few years, probably the end of this dec decade, we'll be at 8K. We'll be, we'll be approaching um, uh, real eyesight kind of levels. And what's interesting about upping your resolution, again, is the clarity, but also it inherently creates a 3D effect. You don't need to wear glasses. You get that 3D depth from a, the high resolution that you go. Uh, I, personally, I think there's some really exciting things to do there. Um, so. Looking at the art style for LA Cops, it was about just asking all these different kinds of questions and going, how can we make something, understanding art, and how can we make something that's going to stand out, grab people's attention? That's, that's the tool that we're using it for. Uh, and the first painting, I don't know if anyone's familiar with this, it's uh, David Hockney's A Bigger Splash. Uh, I love this painting, I just like it. And um, it's, it's an interesting one for me because he painted it, the, the mood at the time was post-war. Uh, it was in California, America was booming, just the optimism, um, the, the kind of luxury, uh, the appeal of this. And I thought, always thought it would be an interesting art style to use in a game because it, it just looks nice. It's not brown and gray. Uh, at the time, I was looking at games, a lot of PS3 and Xbox 360, a lot of brown and gray everywhere. And I just thought, well, one way to stand out is just do the opposite of what other people are doing and then try and do it really, really well. And I thought this was something different. It's appealing. It's fresh. I thought it would make an interesting art style. Um, and if you break it down to, uh, if you take down um, 176 megapixels, you're getting 1.61 1 gigabytes of raw data every time, 72 times a second, the amount of information that's coming in. So what if you just simplify the amount of information that's going into people, stop hammering them, 
Hammer them when you really want to grab their attention, but why not just take it down a step? Because you think about the amount of information we get every single day. It's a phenomenal amount, and it's increasing. So again, why not go the opposite and just take it down? Stand out by not pummeling people with huge amounts of information. Uh, this is another painting that uh, inspired the look of LA Cops, which is uh, standard by Edward Rusker. I forgot that right, sorry. Head's a bit hazy at the moment. Um, he painted this again to sort of show the, the American power, the American dream, the, uh, the optimism there. Um, and I love the, the perspective in it. I love the way he's used shadows. And I thought, again, that was, kind of works with the Hockney. Uh, so I'm putting these together as like a collage. I looked at a lot, a lot of different arts. that talked about breadth earlier being as broad as possible. So put massive mood boards together with lots of images on, and then just try and strip it down, strip it down, strip it down, so focus it, focus it, focus it on something that I think will be uh, strong. Once we got to these images, started to play around. Um, so when I was pitching the game to um, the investors, uh, basically took that as a background image and then put the kind of character over the top. Is anyone familiar with the Beastie Boys Sabotage video? Uh, I always thought that music and the way that, that video feels would be an interesting game to try and get that into a game and start again collaging these things together and take the style from that. Um, another inspiration to this is a game called Interstate 76, which is an old PC game. Uh, and they, they didn't have mouths, they didn't have eyes. And you think about the amount of effort, I, I used to be an animator, the amount of effort that goes into rigging a face and then you've got to uh, skin it properly and then animate it. When actually, if you strip things down, people begin to fill in the gaps themselves. They fill in the characters themselves. So boil the art down to something that's effectively simple, optimistic, and grabs attention just by stripping it right down, by being bright, being vibrant, and being, being different to what else is out there. And looking at, just looking around galleries, looking at magazines, looking at TV, just trying to bring in as many influences as possible, and also attuning it to my tastes, what I like, and hoping that looking around saying, do other people like this? And asking people, what do you think about this picture? Some people don't get David Hockney. I showed it to a, uh, a producer some time ago, and he said, uh, interesting painting. When is it finished? As if the painting hadn't been finished. Some people just don't see it. And you have to, if you pick something out and people don't get it, it's probably not a good idea to use it, because you're trying to make something that engages people. Uh, so now we understand what we're looking at. Let's get the tools to do what we want. So uh, we use the trinity of tools. We're using my LT. Uh, which is the uh, kind of, it's like it's Maya Light, but it's not. It does everything that you need to do for games, um, bar nothing else. Uh, I, I don't, Full Maya has the visual effects tools. I'm never going to use those. So for us, like cost, um, how powerful that tool is, fantastic. Can't recommend it enough. Unity Pro, of course, a lot of people use that, and Photoshop. And that's what Alicops essentially um, developed in. And you can see the pipeline. You go from concept to model to et cetera, et cetera, et cetera going through into the game engine. Um, so. Do we really need to start from scratch from all the models that we do? This model here I actually bought online, and it's got the, sorry, from my experience, it's got the right topology. Uh, the elbows will deform nicely, the shoulders will deform relatively nicely. I can put a few edge leaps in where I want to, but I don't need to start from scratch. I can save myself some time and effort there. And if I know what the characters are going to look like, if I understand the character art. So for example, this character Kowalski, the average height of a male is about six foot, um, Western male is about six foot or 180, 83 centimeters. Um, but what they do in comic art is they exaggerate those performance uh, uh, size. They exaggerate the, um, the body. So here, the character is its about 210 centimeters. By having a smaller head and a more heroic body, the character actually stands out on the screen more. Um, so by taking a trick that they use in comics, you can get characters that feel more solid in the game. If you put normal human proportions in a game, it's accurate, but it, something doesn't feel right about it. If you exaggerate um, how things feel, like the character hands are humongous, but they f you feel the expression in them. It doesn't make logical sense, but we feel things more than we uh, logically go through things. And I think that's something that Van Gogh showed us, that uh, expressing something is more powerful than copying something. But expressing how um, a starry night feels is more powerful than um, literally painting accurately a starry night. Uh, and I think that's an important lesson we can take from, from, uh, from him. Uh, so once you've got the proportions, you understand how that's... You can Take that model that I showed you earlier, and that's literally, I modified it to create that character there. Uh, again, in my RT. And I could start taking the imagery from David Hockney, Edward Ruska, uh, the Beastie Boys, and start merging it together into like, a, I produced this piece of um, mood art, and it's, it's got the, uh, you can see the ambient occlusion there, the shadowing around the trousers. Uh, you can get the vibrancy of the color, how the scene's going to work. And that's actually from the first level 
donut store level in the game. That's actually from that shot. And I just posted up and started to work out, right, this is it. This is, this is the core look of the game. Everything else goes out from this. I've already got five minutes. Wow. I'm going to have to go a bit faster. So, um, yeah, you can see the pipeline there. I stripped it down. Because I know what I'm making, I don't need to go through all that stuff. I don't need to make more work for myself. I can make it a lot more efficient. And end up with uh, an art style that uh, requires minimal texture work, no view, you, well, minimal UV unwrapping. Uh, and it's attainable it, uh, to run at 60 frames per second. Again, we know what people will find appealing at frame rate. Uh, it's a fast production. It's an easy pipeline. And I have fine control over everything. Um, if there's something I don't like, I can change it easily. Um, I just want to talk a little bit about, we're in Holland, uh, the Netherlands, I, th I think it's preferred to be called, and um, looking at his painting. Now, uh, this is, I looked at this painting and I came up with this for the character select. Now, I'm not pretending for a second that I'm anywhere near as good as Rembrandt, but I did look to his work and try and understand how he made what could have been a really boring scene interesting. I think these guys are the... Uh, uh, textile guys, they, they measure the quality of the textiles and the materials going around. And he had to um, show them all being together fairly even, make them interesting, the way he's put the table at a slight angle. He's got someone standing up. Uh, and I just, again, just stole that and put it into LA Cops to, to create an interesting character select screen and engage people. Uh, color. Uh, does anyone recognize this painting, the Monet? Uh, does anyone? There's something missing from this painting. And it's that. The sun is missing. Now, Monet understood that you have complementary colors, colors that vibrate against each other. And it's that, that red sun there, rising or setting, whichever you choose. Uh, that really makes that image work. It makes the image pop uh, using complementary color. And color is one of the most powerful tools, free to use in any game. All our displays can, can show it. If you understand color, that's an incredibly powerful tool for getting your game to stand out. Uh, I use um, Color Scheme Designer which um, works incredibly well for working out complementary colors, which colors go well together. Uh, and atmospheric perspective, I think, is another interesting tool. Um, so Degas, he understood that things that are red appear closer than things that are blue. It's just the way our eyesight is attuned. Uh, so here you can see he's created some depth in the image by putting something very red in the foreground. And having the background of blue, he's created a lot of depth in the scene. And th the next painting I want to show you, this is one of those minimal um, abstract art images where you sort of go, oh, I, I could have done that. But that's the, what the artist is saying. Is that a red square on a blue background, or is it uh, a blue square with a hole in it? It looks like the red square is on top of the blue. And that's it's just an interesting um, art, art things that when you, when you get it, you go, oh, OK, that's quite useful. You can use that. And you can use that in atmospheric perspective. And usefully, uh, the color, color temperature is there in um, Adobe Photoshop. You can see the temperature. So the red, everything down there, um, appears very close to you. If you raise it up to the blues there, where I've got it marked, that's where everything will feel the most far away. And if you desaturate, you can create depth in your scenes, and it just creates a level of believability uh, that isn't always realistic, but it feels real. I could and would go on, but I've got the five-minute sign-up. But um, I just want to finish by saying, in summary, question everything. Be as broad as you can. Um, ask as many questions. When you walk down the street, keep your eyes open. Be looking at everything. Be looking at, particularly around here, the amazing architecture. Why is it built that way? Uh, why are there so many heights? That you go around some of the buildings, they're like labyrinths of uh, different interconnected rooms. And just explore that. Keep your mind open. Uh, some of the questions I would ask, like, how does ambient occlusion work, um, et cetera. And that's it for me, hopefully. Did I finish on time? Did it, thank you. Uh, thank you very much. <laughs> Don't know if we do have time for questions, do we? Any questions? I'm going to get off lightly. Uh, then, uh, well, I, I, I do have one. What would you suggest never to use in terms of colors? Never, like the, uh, the biggest no no? Um, the obvious one is blue and red. Uh, you never put those two together because it. it, it it makes our eyes go fuzzy. Uh, blue is a funny color at the best times, but you put it with red, it, um, yeah, it really makes your, your eyes go fuzzy. Uh, like Nintendo, they would have a lot check to say you can never put those two colors together, because particularly on CRT screens, it would uh, really make them vibrate. So that was what I would say with color. But uh, it's an incredibly complex subject. Uh, there's so much you can learn about it. It's well worth learning, because uh, when you do understand it, it's one of the most powerful tools we have for making games that stand out, I think. OK. Any more questions? Oh. Um, yeah. Um, how long did it took you to um, explore the visual development before you went to, into production, into oh. modeling and so forth? That's so a good question. I, I think, honestly, um, 
when I first saw that Beastie Boys sabotage video in 1990, it, it stuck in my head. And then over time, I collected Interstate 76, Another World, um, looking, I got into art, looking at David Hockney. So it's almost like they got stuck in my head and they gradually collated together over many, many years. Um, so I guess it's been, in that sense, it's been growing for a long time. Um, but when it comes to actually narrowing image down, uh, it can take anywhere from three months to six months, to be honest, to really get an art style together. And it takes a lot of time and patience and keep going with it. And it's, for me, um, I know when it's there, when it feels right, it's worth just going through it, because it, I, I, I wish I'd shown you some of the early work that I did for LA Cops. It's terrible looking back on it, but I had to go through that, I had to keep digging through it um, to find that. It's like they say about writing, it's like digging through dirt till you get to the good stuff. I think it's similar in art. You keep just going through it, going through it, going through it, until you find something that's appealing. It doesn't happen overnight, it's just whack. Okay. Uh, yeah, one more, one more question. Uh, at the start of the presentation, you said, uh, learn to be an artist before you learn the tools. Yes. Um, could you elaborate a bit more about, about what that means? Does it mean to study different yeah. artists first? Or? Um, I think at the time I was beginning to look at art, I, I saw someone who was doing ambient occlusion in games, which at the time was a, was a new idea. And ambient occlusion is the shadowing that we see around in corners of rooms that make them feel solid and grounded and believable. And I asked him technically how he did it in Max, I think was working at the time. And he said, he said Ollie, I'm not going to show you technically how to do this. I'm going to explain to you um, what this is, the theory of it, and then you can go and work it out. And he was right, because when I understood how, what ambient occlusion is, and there's a simple formula behind it, once I understood that, I could get any tool to do it. The way I got it to work in LA Cops um, is incredibly cheap, uh, but I could do that because I understood the effect that I was going for. I understood the art first, and um, I always think uh, emotions are much more powerful than logic in many ways. We do so many irrational things, like poetry is irrational, but I think the world would be a very sad place without it. The, the really, it's one of those annoyingly unquantifiable things: is art and poetry, and having a like having a queen in the UK is it's quite an old-fashioned idea. Why do we, why do we do it? It's, it's not particularly logical. But if you told people we were going to take uh, people in the UK were told they weren't going to have a queen anymore, there'd be uproar. They'd be like, "Oh no, no, we can't do this. This is us. This is our identity. It makes no sense." And that's that's really what art is. It gets you in a headlock and it won't let you go. It's uh, the uh, the imagery around Amsterdam, I'm, I'm looking forward to going around some of the galleries here because you've got world-class art here. There's, there's, there are paintings here, I know, which will just blow you away. And it's, it's well worth doing, I think, because when you see a painting in a book, it's not the same. You have to see it in person because the colors are different. Um, you can't see the texture in an image, particularly in something like a Van Gogh. You need to see it. And uh, until you see it, you can't really get a feeling for it. It's, it's well worth pursuing. I hope that answers your question. Yeah, perfect. Thanks. Thanks, and uh, we are out of time for questions, but uh, just a reminder that you can ca catch Oliver somewhere in the hall for a cup of coffee and maybe a more detailed talk on his success story. Thank you, okay. Thank you.